world, of course, uh, this beast has taken a new shape under the spread of social media, and it is hoodwinking us from impending global and local catastrophes, including the impact of climate change, increasing unemployment and poverty, polarization and communal violence, among so many others. Uh, so without much ado, let me introduce to us, to you, um, our three speakers for today, who will touch on different facets of how disinformation works and what we can do about it. Uh, so, so to begin, I would like to introduce uh, Sophie Zhang. Sophie Zhang is a Facebook whistleblower. She uncovered large-scale political manipulation across two dozen countries, catching two national governments red-handed while also revealing concerning decisions made by Facebook regarding inauthentic inauthenticity in India and the United States. She has testified before the European Parliament, the British Parliament, and the California State Senate. Formerly a data scientist, she currently stays at home with her pet cats. Jarjit Pal, uh, who's our next speaker, is the Associate Professor at the School of Information, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. His recent work has been, has been on the use of social media in mainstream politics in India, studying misinformation networks and discourses. Dr. Pal has also been the visiting scholar at the Research Center for Advanced Science and Technology, University of Tokyo, and at the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law at Stanford University. And our third speaker is Lisa Rappel. Lisa is the Senior Global Social Media and Disinformation Specialist at the International Foundation for Electoral Systems. In this role, she serves as the focal point for research program, uh, research program design and technical assistance to country uh, program for IFES information integrity and counter disinformation portfolio. She has engaged with election commissions, with tribunals, with courts, government interlocutors and civil society in the provision of IFES's technical assistance and research initiative in more than 25 countries. Rappel also facilitates IFES's relationship with private sector technology companies and serves on the board of, uh, of the Observatory of Social Media of the Global Network for Electoral Justice. So thank you very much for joining us. I am absolutely thrilled to be in conversation with you all. Um, so with, to begin this conversation, I would like to ask you about the work you have done and been doing with relation uh, to disinformation. So Sophie, perhaps I can start with you. Uh, in your work on identifying and flagging what Meta calls coordinated inauthentic behavior, it gave you an overview of the tactics used by actors to manipulate Facebook and spread disinformation. So what can you tell us about what you learned about disinformation tactics and networks in India and other Asian countries? And what did you observe about the willingness of companies like Meta to take steps to address this problem? Thank you very much. And so I'm going to start by first, by first, because I know we have many students attending and others, I'm going to first explain, break down this information this work in the first place. It's essentially the union of two different areas. First, to, uh, intentional targeted misinformation, and also the use of inauthentic identities to spread messages. And these are two separate and these are two separate areas and, and qualities I've worked on the latter. If, for instance, if, for instance, someone says the moon is made out of cheese, this is misinformation, regardless of who is saying it. If they know it's false, it's disinformation. And this is true no matter who is saying it, whether they're a politician, whether they're a, a, fame, a celebrity, a 10-year-old ch child on social media, et cetera. In, contra in contrast, in the use of inauthentic activities depends only on who is saying it, not what they are saying. It's, if I set up 10,000 fake accounts on social media to say the moon is made out of rock, there's nothing wrong with this message, except that I'm using fake accounts to say it and thereby drawn out the voices of actual people. And so 
these two areas sound similar, but they but they're quite different in terms of behavior and scope. And you can be and most and and you can be one without the other. And I'm speaking solely on on the latter, the use of fake accounts. And so, when I was at face, Facebook, now Meta, I, I worked in my spare time to to, fi to find networks of fake accounts used across countries. I'm going to de I'm going to de describe examples in in two Asian countries, India and also Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan is it's a Caucasian country north of Iran and east east of Armenia and Georgia, south of Russia. It's a post-Soviet country. That is that has been that by the former KGB head and his and his, and his son since the it's almost since the disintegration of the Soviet Union. It is so democratic that in 2013 they managed to accidentally release election results a day before the actual election before any votes were cast. And and anyways. In Azerbaijan, what the government was what the government was doing was setting up thousands of fake accounts, fake pay, Facebook pages, and other assets in order to harass the opposition en masse. So that every time an opposition figure posted something on Facebook, every time an opposition news source, every time foreign news sources reporting on the opposition, such as BBC Azerbaijan, or Voice of America Azerbaijan, or Radio Free Europe Azerbaijan posted something, they would be immediately deluged by hundreds or thousands of comments about how the opposition were traitors, about how the about how the government did not need Western democracy and Western influences, and it, it's it's a, etc. Basically, supporting the government line and harassing people who disagreed with them, and this, as you might expect, was had an actual chilling effect. And if if you if you're going to post a scene on social media and you know you're going to get hundreds of comments about why you're evil, you might be less inclined to post it. And it also creates essentially a false narrative. Like for instance, during the recent uh, tensions with, with, uh, and in, between Armenia and Azerbaijan, Azari political figures uh, in the opposition expressed their opposition. And news articles reflect, announced that and also noticed and also reported that the, that their Sentiments were not universally shared because many people who supported the government in the comments. These many people were, in fact, uh, people paid by the governments working working shifts every day, only on weekdays and not during that and not during holidays to support the government using fake assets and accounts. And so, and so, and so it creates a it's in, it's essentially creates an environment where people are. Uh, where people think that the government has more support than it actually did. In India, meanwhile, I found networks of fake accounts across the political spectrum. It, it's it, unfortunately the use of fake accounts called IT cells in India is universalized and common to the extent that they might that you might say that's just an ongoing arms race. I'm going to use I'm going to describe one specific example that occurred in Delhi. Delhi is the capital of India. Before the state assembly elections in in early 2020, Delhi is a region, but it has a population of about 20 million, much larger than much larger than many U.S. states and and many small countries. And so, in the lead up to the election, in in the lead up to the election, support the, a, a large number of fake accounts expressed ex, pretended to be members of a different party. In order to, uh, while expressing support for for, for 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 another party, basically to use to use an analogy, because I'm assuming people here are familiar with U.S. politics, this is the equivalent of someone of having a large number of fake accounts saying, "I'm normally a Republican, I voted for Donald Trump, but now I'm supporting and now I'm support supporting." Um, I forgot who the Democratic governor of Kentucky is, but but that it, it, is it Andy Bashir? I, I don't remember. I, I don't remember. And, and, and basically saying basically saying that they are crossing over to vote for this person in, 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 in that 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 they, that, they, that their support for Donald Trump is not it, it's not um, 
it, it does not exclude the support for Andy Bashir. And in fact, they were voting for them for the same reasons in, the, in an attempt to convince others to get crossover support. With regards to Facebook's responses, with, with Azerbaijan, after I caught the government red-handed, they took more than a year to take it down because Azerbaijan is of course a small country. It's not exactly the ones that most people th think of, even when they think of, a a when they think of Asia, when they think of uh, countries that they care about, etc. In contrast, India, it's a large and important country. And so Ryan found networks of fake accounts active in India. Facebook was, quick, was relatively quick to act. They, I needed to pressure them a bit, but they acted. But they acted for the most part within a few weeks. With one exception, one network of fake accounts that I caught was, I found that it was that it was tied directly to a sitting member of the Indian Parliament, who was, in fact, and quite ironically, the chairperson of the Parliamentary Committee for Ethics in the Lok Sabha, the Indian Parliament. As soon as this discovery was made. Everything shut down within Facebook. I could not get an answer from anyone. I would I would bring up other subjects, such as, for instance, the fake account network in Delhi. And then I would say, are well, we acting on this? Can we also get a decision about the, this network in Kaushambi with the, with the MP? If we don't, then we will be accused of being partial. And they were quite happy to engage on one subject, but not the other. And and it's, and essentially, Facebook's response is a double-edged sword. Because India is important, it, Facebook is quicker to act. But because India is important, it is also much more subject to political pressure from the governments. In contrast, after I got the, the government red-handed, Facebook was willing to act on my discovery to, it, against, that, against that government because Azerbaijan is, frankly, a small and poor country. And... and, and and, and so that put the, and that size and importance and political influence is a double-edged sword. I hope that makes sense. Thank you very much, Sophie. This was a very important uh, revelation, and thank you for laying out it out for us. Um, but, uh, so uh, now we, I, I think I'll turn to uh, Dr. Paul. Uh, Dr. Paul, you've been researching uh, research, researching disinformation by politicians, especially in India, for a while now. And so we would love to hear from you about uh, your report on the 2019 elections and more broadly on the disinformation by political parties in the country. What are the major trends? Who is more responsible? Um, is the traditional media establishment or watchdogs like fact checkers able to beat back the tide of disinformation? And how does this online disinformation impact uh, real world communities? Well, thank you, Ishani, and uh, thank you folks for uh, having me here. Uh, I'd like to start by recognizing uh, Sophie for the work that uh, she's done. I've worked in tech before this, um, and I have worked in several situations where you are very familiar of how a company might be in cahoots with the government or what have you. And um, many of us are actually aware of these situations and do not either have the gumption or the ability at a given point to act on that because of the consequences it brings our careers and what have you. And, and it's really, really impressive that uh, Sophie and the little uh, cat there um, have, have, have managed to pull off here. So, so this, is, uh, this is really, really worth uh, pointing out here, the strength of what, what's been done here. Um, anyway, so um, in our work specifically, we, to give you an overview, we track about 40,000 Indian politicians from all levels, from members of parliaments all, all the way uh, down to um, MLCs or people who work on their teams who are uh, self proclaimed part of a political party um, um, on, on Twitter. And what we do is we archive what they've been talking about, how that moves over time, et cetera, et cetera. Alongside that, we archive the tweets of about 11,000 or so influencers in India. And by influencers, I mean journalists, uh, celebrities, sports persons, government accounts, et cetera, et cetera. And, and what we typically then do is look at some issue and say, well, how has this 
party talked about it or how has this uh, um, the general Indian population talked about it vis-a-vis -vis, say influencers or say politicians etc so so in in a nutshell what we do is track politicians for campaign behavior but alongside that track influencers for how they play into political behavior All right uh, so in terms of the 2019 election in India, I, I, I feel there are two important things I should point out. One is that the notion of social media as an election peaking event for politicians is increasingly less relevant because politicians are more or less increasingly in constant election campaigning mode, um, especially from certain parties. It's not like uh, there are certain clearly peaks in activity just before a specific uh, seat goes to election. But in general, the more common thing is that there are state elections and some of these state elections are very important. And so there, therefore, uh, politicians are always three to six months away from an election. And actually, you know, uh, BJP, for instance, has has very uh, frequently talked about being constantly in campaign mode, and which is, which is, I think, very important for a political party to constantly have a sense of what's um, what the electorate is doing. Um, that's one thing. But the second thing, which actually concerns me a little bit more, is whether disinformation and or and specifically the notion of fake news is in and of itself a concept we need to move away from because so much of what is polarizing information cannot be legally construed as explicit misinformation. So what does it mean when you have a constant flow of innuendo, which is much more common in political speech than explicit disinformation that you can get a platform to, to act on, for instance. And what we've seen in India is this, this constant flow of information which looks like it's asking a question from a, from a strictly semantic construction point of view, but is actually doing something which is much closer to a dog whistle. And that that element of it is a constant stream of what is coming from political accounts, irrespective of when um, around an election cycle, those conversations are concentrated. Uh, in terms of the general 2019 election, what is definitely true as a contrast from the 2014 election is that all parties had figured out some form of social media, which is generally effective, with perhaps the exception of the communists uh, who, who didn't really do this very well. Um, but uh, for sure, Congress uh, had not caught up with BJP, but had definitely got the, the party mechanism in terms of uh, your PR people, your outreach, IT cells, et cetera. Samajwadi party had that. So all the parties had kind of invested in something around that. But the advantage that BJP had in this election is twofold. One is that it already had a very strong set of citizens who were aligned with the ideology and aligned with uh, supporting the party that, uh, that the other parties did not have at the same scale. Okay, so even though a Hindi language, Twitter was really on the upswing and then there were certain politicians um, you know, Tejasri Yadav, for example, Akhilesh as well, uh, who had their own circles, uh, they didn't match on a national scale what BJP was able to do. Okay, and, 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 and there's very good examples for this in terms of hashtags and how quickly one party is able to make one go viral versus another. The second thing is that before the election, Modi had actually made a very interesting statement in which he noted that any politician who wishes to have a ticket to fight the election in 2019 needed to have at least 300,000 supporters or followers on Twitter, which is, which is a very unique kind of thing for a politician to say, where the party top down is making a requirement that your communication will now be mediated through this channel. And that of course has meaning because now you no longer need to be um, interrupted by a, a mainstream journalist. You basically say what you want to say on social media. And if a journalist wants to cover you, they just have to look at your account. 
So what this does to the ability of a politician to present their narrative versus whatever might be closer or farthest away from misinformation is very complex because it takes away the journalist's ability to question. So bringing this back full circle, what I feel is the much bigger issue here is the cutting away of mainstream media from questioning politicians. And while it might have started with some of the things that we, uh, with, we saw with the initial Modi campaign where he basically stopped doing uh, interviews for the most part, has now extended to all politicians. So while we might uh, have a conversation about who has more disinformation or not, the bigger problem is that the citizenry is increasingly cut out from being able to question a politician. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. That's uh, for that very important uh, aspect of Indian politics. And I think we'll there are, there must be a lot of follow up questions. I already have a follow up question to uh, to your um, small uh, talk. Uh, so let me just move on to Lisa Rappel. Uh, so Lisa. Um, your work for the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, uh, where you advised election planners around the world, uh, including on issues of online disinformation. So first of all, how do you observe disinformation impacting the wor work of election commissions in particular in Asia and even beyond? Uh, but what concrete steps does IFIS advisory commissions take to combat this phenomena? And I think this is a, also a very important thing that we have to touch upon. Thanks, Ishani. I appreciate that. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to add an element to this conversation of not just how complex this problem is, but what types of solutions are being tried globally to, to move the needle on this broader issue set. Um, a little bit about IFAS for those that might not be familiar with us. Um, the International Foundations for Electoral Systems is a large nonpartisan, non-governmental international organization. We've been around for more than 35 years and have country offices in, in more than 40 countries that are staffed with local expertise, deep local expertise. So my role in headquarters is really to facilitate some of the knowledge exchange that's happening in our different country offices, including longstanding programs um, throughout, throughout Asia, though I would like to point out not in India. So I will be limiting my remarks um, in that regard. Um, so to your first point of how do, you, how do we observe uh, disinformation impacting election commissions, and I would say it's an issue that's front and center for all of the folks that are in charge of, of putting on elections. And this is something that I've actually seen shift since I started researching this topic in 2018, where at that time, election authorities that sort of had an institutional approach or policy on countering disinformation or boosting trust in election results were seen sort of as cutting edge or out in front. And we're sort of at the point now that if you are an election commission, this isn't an optional um, avenue for you to be thinking about. That uh, sort of the core mandate of, of an election commission putting on an operationally excellent election is no longer enough to ensure that the results of that election are trusted. And so if you're looking to support electoral integrity and putting on a good election isn't enough, it's almost a co-equal need in terms of how you're bolstering trust, transparency, the credibility of the election commission and the electoral process, particularly in an era where um, domestic political contestants, malign foreign actors in some instances, see that really punching at the credibility of those that are putting on the election is a really great way to, so decide, uh, to, to stoke um, societal tensions, potentially generating conflict, just undermining trust in, in democracy more broadly. So when we look at um, sort of what, what is ISIS doing in this space, what are our partners in election commissions doing in this space? Um, I'll highlight just a few that come to mind. Um, there's an increasing recognition that's sort of coalescing around work that election commissions are doing on strategic communication, crisis communication when mis, uh, misleading narratives about the election emerge, social media strategy, it's almost uh, sort of, if you want to package it baldly, like reputation management for election commissions, that I think this would have been sort of unheard of or unthinkable even five or 10 years ago, that this should be a core central like effort of election commissions. But when you look at the ways in which um, 
election commissions are perceived to be trusted messengers, disseminating credible information about elections, communicating with the media, with political parties, with civil society, but there's a lot of work to be done here. Um, I had the privilege of chatting with the, the um, second in command at the Australian Election Commission recently. He was talking about the Australian case of really investing in um, sort of building trust through strategic communication and reputation management and the implications for the broader um, Pacific region as well as was the context we were talking in. But lots of times you have smaller election commissions, but they still are, are um, actively investing and in thinking about how are they communicating in ways that build trust. Um, other examples that we've seen include um, codes of conduct for political parties and political contestants in terms of their online conduct. Um, codes of conduct can be very toothless, um, but there are a couple instances where we've seen them built with a lot of significant buy-in from political contestants themselves. Um, the example of South Africa's code of um, good practice on, on disinformation in elections comes to mind. This is a pretty tightly defined um, code of conduct that was built with consensus from the political parties. And then ultimately, um, sort of there's, there's remedies and sanctions built into the code of conduct beyond just content removal, which I think is interesting when we think about the, what are the basket of solutions that could be applied, including requiring political parties to issue um, sort of corrections for factually inaccurate information around the elections, um, maintaining sort of a database of, of electoral disinformation where parties would be sort of named and shamed for, for what they were disseminating, which actually in this particular context was sort of an incentive that folks were, were responding to. Um, and of course, having some elements of, of due process um, around this as well. Um, and that, that sort of is a contrast to some of the responses that we're seeing in um, India, in Indonesia, in Brazil, to use Sophie's language, some of these larger market important countries that are seeing that they really do have the ear of um, social media and technology companies. And um, I think we could debate at length um, the, the challenges that go along with this approach, but essentially having government mandated um, content takedown requests that the platforms are feeling compelled to respond to, or at least be geotagging content so that it's not available in particular contexts. Um, this of course is a tricky one because there's a lot of um, potentials for, for misuse and abuse, but is also responding to a very real need in the sense of, um, you know, uh, national institutions wanting to uh, reclaim some sovereignty around these issues where, where technology companies really maintain a lot of a lot of the power. Um, I would also um, uh, just to, to highlight some of the collaborative approaches we're seeing from election commissions, um, you know, tech actors, we can talk all day about um, how, how good faith they are acting or not, but they are certainly very critical and important um, actors in the space. So we're seeing um, election commissions become increasingly equipped to be engaging directly with the platforms in ways that have driven some observable impact, though there's certainly um, some dissatisfaction there as well in terms of the responsiveness of, of platforms. Um, but then I did want to highlight an example from the region um, from Indonesia's 2019 elections, which is a really interesting model in um, civil society collaboration with election commissions and sort of whole of society approaches. So um, Boaslu, uh, one of Indonesia's two electoral oversight bodies, um, it sort of had a very concerted effort to engage with civil society, with religious leaders, with universities, sort of pre-election to start defining collectively a declaration of principles around what types of content are out of bounds in, in the context of elections from, from a, um, a principled perspective. Again, getting this like multi-stakeholder consultation and buy-in and starting to build, to build a broader, broader network of folks who are invested in promoting credible narratives around the election. Then they were able to sort of pivot and build on some of that ground, um, that, that work to build those type of multi-stakeholder coalitions, piloting a couple of um, hoax crisis centers in particularly conflict-prone areas of the country, where again, you had this mix of journalists, religious leaders, community leaders, who were sort of actively involved in debunking sort of very locally directed um, narratives that had the potential to incite violence or, or be troublesome in other ways. Um, and then another way that um, Boaslu worked with civil society and others was um, 
signing memorandums of understanding with a, a fact-checking organization and an electoral oversight civil society organization to both be exchanging information around sort of narratives around the election as they were bubbling up, but also um, to sort of be credible messengers that were amplifying good information around the election. Um, I've got a lot more examples to highlight, but I'm sure we'll get to those in the discussion. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, thank you very much, Lisa. I think these, uh, you know, this infrastructure that countries are investing in building through civil society organization and citizenship are one of the very important point to combat it. And we'll only be able to see in the future how effective they are for sure. Uh, but I think there is a desire to uh, combat this. Uh, so I do want to go to questions right now, but uh, perhaps I could, uh, I perhaps I can start off with a question for the panel. Um, and uh, then we'll uh, go to David and he has a question too, I think. Um, so in places like India, the Philippines, and even countries outside Asia, like Brazil, populist leaders have dominated the social media landscape and have been able to create a particular sort of information ecosystem. And why has that happened? What is it about the medium that lends itself to populist leaders uh, in each of your work? If uh, Is it something specific in populist strategies or discourses? Do you see the landscape changing? And I think uh, Dr. Paul did speak a little bit about how the landscape is changing, but is it uh, is is there any sort of competition? Is, is it possible to actually um, use social media in the way that, or yeah, I will just hand it over to anyone, anyone like to go? I can start, I suppose. So I want to be clear that this is not what I personally worked on, but in general, I think that social media has led to a change in the inform information ecosystem. Like most of the discussion has been around content moderation and should this content be allowed on the platform. But to me, that is the that is the wrong focus when you're talking about things like misinformation, hate speech, or et cetera, because these have always existed. Like 70 years, like 60 years ago in the United States. The main conspiracy, the, there was a big conspiracy theory that the right was a communist mind control plot. To, 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 to. Like conspiracy theories have always existed. What is new is that these are given distribution because 60 years ago, I mean, the, the New York Times, the, the Washington Post, uh, the, the television news networks, these were not give the right to the, the, the mind control theory the time of day. And so these essentially acted as gatekeepers to, fil to filter and curate what got attention. And today, those gatekeepers are gone. I was originally very positive on this back a, a decade ago. I thought that it's good that, the, that we're getting the, rid of the gatekeepers. There's too many barriers to the free flow of information. <laughs> but in retrospect, any time you make drastic changes, and remove existing barriers without considering why they are there in the first place. I mean, I mean that can cause an unintended consequences, and I think we're still grappling with the impacts of that now. And so, like, ultimately, popular. Pop, I mean, ultimately, I think the answer is that um, pop, pop, populist populist ideas such as questioning authority. And such as such such as being critical of those in, 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 in being critical of the of, of those in the establishment, etc., they were be they were they were historically being gate being gatekept and 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 looking and looking back, I think there I think there was a reason and some argument for that, and those gatekeepers are now gone. Thanks a lot for that, Sophie. Sorry, I, I got dropped off for a second. Uh, so as I understand it, the question was around why are we seeing uh, more misinformation from populist leaders? Well, the short answer to that is that uh, a lot of study on social media shows that we uh, crowds, which is all of us included, um, reward bad behavior. So 
uh, the more extreme what you're saying, the more likely it is to get an um, get a reaction. Uh, the, the, the current owner of uh, Twitter is a good example of what's happening in that kind of um, uh, whether it's incendiary comments or whether it's things that that get a reaction in people. And alongside that, what you also see is people after a certain point of time get used to hearing the same story over and over again, such that it just uh, is something that resonates with them. A great example of this in India is uh, the use of Pappu to describe uh, Rahul Gandhi, which started uh, very early in the, even prior to the 2014 campaign. And at a certain point, people had just come to believe that Rahul Gandhi was a very stupid person. And uh, over time, as people heard him more and more, and then there were more um, there were uh, initially there were a lot of edited videos of him going around, which um, showed him out of context and seemingly saying um, uh, daft things. Uh, over time, as it became clearer that he is not the person that is being projected uh, to be, that narrative declined. So then you don't see Pappu as much uh, to, to describe Rahul Gandhi. Um, and it just tells you a little bit about what the power of a certain discourse when very systematically put out can be. What's also important about uh, these, uh, the, about you, you know, you bring up Jair Bolsonaro, and you can argue that Imran Khan is very much in the same vein as well, is they have very well oiled machineries of control for the social media um, top down action. But even more importantly, they have a radicalized core of followers who will latch on to what they say. And that these people will do the work of outreach because the leader says so. And the third and final and um, arguably equally important piece of this is that in each of these cases, the, um, the leader has a core of influencer followers, often digital influencer followers, who will do their bidding. And then that becomes the next row of attack for spreading a certain kind of information, um, especially if it's uh, the kind of um, extreme reaction that does the influencer some good as well. That's additional benefit for the people who are engaging in that. But you have to think about this as a complete change. And again, I'm glad that Sophie brought, brought about 10 years back is this idea in early days of social media that somehow the crowd is this wise, benevolent, being that will do good things for everybody and democratize everyone. Well, A, we somehow made certain assumptions about human nature, and B, we underestimated the ability of institutions to capture these uh, spaces. And what happened with Facebook is a great example of that. At the end of the day, uh, Twitter today has to do business in various countries where there are opposition leaders who are up against a very um, uh, dominant hegemonic machinery on social media. And who are they going to shake hands with? And uh, these are uh, questions where the the rational answer for a large corporation is to shake hands with the governments. And uh, if you're thinking for the best of your shareholders in the short term, then that is what you will do. Just to jump in with one more thing that I that I think about a lot in the context of my role. Um, I mean, make this uh, hypothetically even playing field, even if we take off um, coordinated and authentic behavior or manipulation of the information space and we just talk about social media as a conduit for communicating your message, social media is ideally suited for sound bites, for sensationalism, for narratives that are easy to understand and easy to digest. And a lot of populist candidates tend to capitalize on these types of narratives that confirm people's biases, stoke their fears, um, so when we look at the converse of that, of people that are committed to democratic principles, human rights principles, democratic processes, it's a much more nuanced and complex and much less sexy set of talking points that you're working from. 
Um, so it is an uphill battle, but I don't think that that's justification for not giving greater attention to how are we communicating the values of um, democracy and process and human rights in a way that resonates. I guarantee you it's not by saying democracy and human rights and process matter. That's not a talking point that tends to particularly resonate. So when we're talking about how we're working with election commissions or how we're working with fact-checking organizations, I feel like we're you know, in 2016 and beyond, there was a huge rush towards equipping fact checkers. And now we're recognizing like how much, how much does this actually drive impact? And I think it's part of the recognition of um, a, a viral tweet pay, preying on a confirmation bias or a base human emotion next to, you know, a very well thought out researched six paragraph rebuttal they're never going to resonate in the same way. So I think we do, this isn't enough on its own, but one of the components is thinking about as um, sort of folks on the side of democratic systems, how are we just communicating in ways that are that are better and more realistically positioned to to where where people are at, not where where you might ideally hope that people are. That's great. Thanks so much, everybody. Um, if I can just jump in here for uh, a second. Um, and I see that we've got a hand up in the audience, which is excellent. And if, if folks in the audience want to chat questions in or also put hands up, this is the time to prepare uh, those thoughts because we'll have a little bit of time for discussion. Uh, but if maybe briefly, I could uh, put one more agen issue on the agenda that hasn't uh, directly come up yet for, uh, for any of you who might have a view. Um, this is obviously an international challenge, right? We've heard cases across Asia and even beyond Asia already discussed today. Um, there have been some kind of early forms of international cooperation, discussion potentially even of regulation um, related to addressing these kinds of challenges. Um, there's a US-backed declaration for the future of the internet initiative that I've heard a little bit about, but I'm definitely not an expert on. I'm curious if any of you all have any views on the potential for international coordination or regulation um, to, uh, to bring a meaningful difference in this sphere, or is this really the kind of thing that needs to be tackled on a country by country basis because the situations um, don't lend themselves to a, a kind of unified uh, regulatory approach? Um, I can kick us off on this one with a few thoughts. Um, I think that there is absolutely a role for international coordination and probably international regulation in this space. Um, but I also tend to think that while it's an important conversation, particularly sort of platform accountability related regulation, that there's not a silver arrow that we're going to get the regulation right and the platforms are going to suddenly be able to solve this problem for us because it's so much more complex and nuanced. And I think what that calls for when we think about international cooperation isn't one be all end all approach that we're looking to, but that there are lots of specific levers that might be available to us when we think about making change and we can drive international conversations there. So to provide an example, um, in the week after next IFIS is bringing together global partners to launch an online campaigning transparency community of practice. So these are oversight institutions that have some sort of mandate to like set the rules of the road about what's allowable for domestic political contestants in terms of online campaigning, as well as civil society, academics, um, election observers that are looking at um, like how are we bringing greater transparency and accountability into the types of campaigning that's happening in online spaces. And so when we bring together this specialized international cooperation and conversation around a, a narrower topic, you can start to look at um, like how might political finance or spending disclosure uh, be brought to bear on this issue of, of how much money is being channeled into sort of creating covert information operations as part of a, a, a normal state of play in a lot of domestic political campaigning now. Um, so I'm a bit off topic there, but that's a way to say there's there's the broad funnel, but I think we can think about international cooperation in more specific ways too. So my personal opinion and view is that, I mean, when I've talked to national and supranational legislatures, such as the British Parliament, the European Parliament, most of them seem mostly concerned with social media as used in their own country or their own supranational region, which it's how most people worldwide behave. I mean, Kentuckians are more concerned about what happens in Kentucky than what happens in Texas, let alone what happens in Honduras or some far off country. But it, it does mean that so far, regulation of social media has been not much on the international cooperation, 
but rather, uh, but rather directed towards each country looking to regulate it in their own country and then having side effects that in, with international repos. But since, but but for for some areas like what happened in Azerbaijan or with the government, I mean the Azeri government is never going to regulate social media to tell it that to tell Facebook that it has to take down the Azeri government's troll farms. I mean that's not going to happen. And and, and at the same time, Western governments look unlikely to do this. And even if they did, I think the optics would frankly be terrible. There would be accusations of colonialism if the US government were to regulate that in that Facebook has to take down Indian troll farms or something like that. And 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 so and so ultimately when I when I've dis when I've discussed it with regulate with with regulators and politicians, uh, what I've done is made suggestions that would have international impacts, even if those countries are focused on the impact in their own country, because that seems to be the rot the rot in my personal experience that legislators are focused on right now. Yeah, I've never nothing really substantive to add there. All countries have rules, including here in the States, around what we think of as fair and not fair to have publicly online. And it's just a matter of um, spectrum of how much that is being used for politically expedient and uh, purposes. And, and that can be argued just about anywhere. At the end of the day, you're not going to get around domestic laws if that country in question is large enough to matter as a market for you it's just not going to happen in my opinion so that's great thanks um so i see hands up in the audience from uh lisa and uh, parto and so maybe i could ask you to in the um in the interest of of time to ask your questions one after another and then the panel as a whole can sort of synthesize a response i think that would be a great way to go so thanks uh, maybe lisa first and then parto Sure. Uh, thank you so much. It's um, it's a pleasure to uh, well, let me lower my hand to be in the room and and thank you for convening this conversation. Um, I'm wondering, if, and this is coming out of my own uh, research in in Mumbai. One thing I've been really interested in is um, how do we account for the different ways in which I mean I, I forget there was a question earlier about whether there is something inherent to social media, the sort of affordances of social media that are that sort of yield a populist um, or that populists are better at using it or something. Um, and, uh, you know, and then there was a question about, you know, are we talking about disinformation or is this something more about the kind of more emotive appeal, uh, appeals to um, to voters, the kind of dog whistle. So it's not about true or false, but kind of enlisting um, affect in a maybe disingenuous way or in a kind of, um, you know, in a way that's not about sort of being clear about what policies are. And one thing I've been really curious about in my work in Bombay is how to account for the different ways in which um, these communications are received and interpreted. So why is it that in some places, even in the same city or in the same country, there can be publics that are very good at kind of, you know, are very literate, I might say, in kind of, you know, reading and interpreting the media landscape, like the traditional media, social media, you know, real, fake, whatever, theatrical, whatever it is, there are certain people that, you know, um, seem to be better at uh, maybe not being deceived or at kind of making use of information. I'm just wondering if there's any thoughts on, uh, is there any interesting research about this? Because it's, um, it seems that, you know, on the production side, a lot of the conversation has been about the production side and controlling, but but I think there's also some really interesting um, yeah, questions uh, to be asked about, you know, how do folks go about navigating, like who is fooled and who isn't? Great, thanks. And then Parto, could you uh, maybe add your question too? And then we can have our panelists kind of respond as they as best fits their uh, expertise. Thanks. Wonderful. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it quick. I have two uh, two quick questions. One has to do with uh, learning effects. Are we at all seeing learning effects kick in? Our audience is going to wise up to the way uh, disinformation works on social media at some point. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And the other question actually has to do with the balance between disinformation on WhatsApp and on public platforms. 
I'm I'm uh, I'm part of a civil society organization called India Civil Watch International, and we in civil society have paid a lot of attention to the public platforms. Uh, is there something about the economics of disinformation, you know, that uh, that makes WhatsApp just a more complicated platform to spread disinformation in because you need to have uh, many actors, you know, multiple groups, you need to recruit people to these groups, etc. Whereas Facebook and Twitter are more like broadcast uh, kind of quick uh, spreaders of disinformation. So, so just wanted to get a sense of uh, should civil society organizations pay more attention than they have been doing to WhatsApp to trying to break that black box open. I'll stop that. I can start here if that uh so uh both the questions are related and um starting with lisa's question um of what is the existing uh some of the existing knowledge on this the there is this uh, interesting book very great book right by finn brunton which looks at at spam and the history of spam and the notion of the Nigerian scam and why that's the Nigerian scam, why you, you hold it as a Nigerian scam so that only the most gullible will fall for it. Um, and, and, and many of us in this room have, uh, have grown up using email before we used mobile apps. And so a lot of us were familiar with the notion of uh, an email scam, which looks funky. Like there's something about it that seems just off. And we know how to recognize that. And an important aspect of what's happened in India, especially in the run-up to the 2019 election, and even more importantly, the 2017 Uttar Pradesh election, was that you had a flood of people coming online who had no past experience with being scammed online. So, so there was that part that you have, you have a huge population which is relatively new, suddenly got access to um, to online spaces. And if it's online, it must be true. Of course, you know, that, that, that tapers over time. And the general... Um, Learning effects, um, again, coming to Partho's question here, is that it works in the opposite direction, is that the learning effects are much better for those who are trying to manipulate you than they are for those who are trying to catch the manipulation. So you get better and better over time at appealing to the persons um, uh, because issues have multiple facets, because the binary between misinformation and truth is not binary in some sense. And um, if you go back to the literature on why people um, accept misinformation, there is essentially, you know, uh, the classic stuff goes to epistemic, existential, and social form reasons for accepting misinformation. You know, epistemic is something like if you ever travel through India and you stop the car, you know, this is pre Google Maps or whatever, and you ask somebody, hey, where is this so and so place? They will say, go straight. And that is epistemic misinformation where they don't really know where you're going, but they're telling you, just go straight. It must be somewhere there. It's like, I don't want to look like I don't know what I'm saying to you. So you just go straight. So the point is that you come to every intersection and keep asking where to go next rather than get that you know epistemic misinformation. We want to make sense of the world. So we come up with the best possible answer at a given point of time. And the existential misinformation is when you somehow see yourself at some form of threat and that makes you more likely to accept certain kinds of misinformation and COVID misinformation is a good example of this where people were worried they didn't know what was going on so the idea that uh, Muslim vendors are licking fruits and spreading misinformation or Tablighi Jamaat is doing uh, things to explicitly spread uh, COVID in India were, were very appealing. And then the last, of course, is the social misinformation, which is potentially the most dangerous as far as political misinformation goes, where there is a piece of misinformation which looks makes your group look better than the other group. And whether or not that is true, the desired effect is that your group looks better than the other group, so long as that message gets propagation. So uh, we've studied this among people, and frequently they will say that, yeah, I thought this likely isn't true, but you know, it made those people look bad, so I'm going to spread it anyways. And the fact is that Twitter is where most academic research happens because the API is open. Like they, You can get that data. Nobody knows what's happening in WhatsApp. So of course, yes, you should focus on WhatsApp because that's where the more radical stuff is being said that you can't say in public. 
but how are you going to systematically study it? I mean, the Brazilians uh, prior to the Bolsonaro election did a few things to get to that, but it's just really difficult because of access to the groups. So that's probably a reason for why there isn't a lot of WhatsApp work in academia, but uh, not, not saying that that's not what you should do. Sorry for the long answer. Sir. To add to that, I would say that one of, one of the mechanisms of misinformation is also just that it fits into your existing narrative system and it feels true regardless of whether it's true or not. In the same way that if, for instance, there were a news article saying that it's saying tomorrow that saying tomorrow by a shape by a questionable news source such as Palmer Report or someone that Trump had been paid mi millions by the Russians to sell information to them, this would be believed by many people in America because it fits into the belief system, whether it is true or not. The same thing has happened in India. For instance, in India recently, there were there were question there was a news report of questionable validity by the wire that was found to be based on fraudulent documents and retracted. And many people who are often and usually good at sifting through news sources believed this because it, both because there was effort put into this by, and it was published by a, by a news source and also because it fit into existing narratives of the Indian government and as having as being in close cahoots with Facebook, which is true, and the Facebook doing shady things, which is true. But the actual story was not true. And I mean, like 10 years ago, Stephen Colbert came up with, this, with the term truthiness of something that feels true, even if it isn't true. And it was a joke at the time, but today this is what everyone is doing, what, what everyone is feeling. With regards to the other questions, uh, I would I would briefly add that, I, I, like like Dr. Paul said, the main issue with WhatsApp, I think, is that of access, which is precisely why a lot of mis misinformation does happen on WhatsApp because the, because of the there is little opportunity for oversight and fact checking, as opposed to say face, Facebook. There are, and and there and for the misinformation for those who wish to spread misinformation there are some minor barriers I believe there are limits to how many people you can spread you can share WhatsApp messages to at the same time whereas on Facebook you can you, you can you can share it and have your entire audience see it but to myself this is a question not of not a smaller impact on, on WhatsApp, but simply a smaller re researcher visibility into WhatsApp. It's easier for researchers to study something that's open, and so they study what is. And th that does not mean that places in which they do, do where there is less visibility into have less bad things going on. Anyways, I think we're the on time. I'll pass it over to Lisa if she has anything. <laughs> Thanks, Sophie. Um, a few thoughts to add to that, uh, just in terms of bridging the practitioner academic divide, uh, Lisa, in response to your question. Um, uh, one of the sort of very common interventions that a lot of folks are trying is media literacy, uh, digital literacy trainings being implemented globally. Um, I There's sort of a, a, an academic, rich academic thread that I'm sort of less able to speak to, but in terms of the pr practitioner side, um, I've seen a few sort of impact evaluations of media literacy interventions in terms of looking at like, what actually is impactful when we think about um, uh, sort of different populations responses to some of these types of interventions. Um, and then I, as practitioners, there's certainly a robust conversation about how are you tailoring some of these media literacy interventions to actually speak to the differential experiences, particularly of marginalized and underrepresented groups. Um, certainly IFIS is, is um, sort of does a, a thread of media literacy work working with um, marginalized groups in the Mekong region, for example. Um, speaking to WhatsApp, again, a couple interesting practitioner side interventions that I've seen with WhatsApp. Um, I'm, this example has stuck with me, though I'm going to admit it's from 2018 and I'm, I'm not aware of where it's gone, but there was an initiative called COFACTS out of Taiwan, which was a group of um, civil society, uh, sort of very uh, Technolo technologically sophisticated civil society coalition working as volunteers. And what they were able to do is um, sort of create a reporting channel where folks could forward pieces of content that they were seeing across platforms, but also on WhatsApp into a, a database 
that then when that content was also circulated in WhatsApp, folks had the opportunity to introduce a like a bot into their WhatsApp chat that would almost like automatically fact check if like the, that um, story sort of was querying a story that was in their fact checking database. It was then sort of introduced into um, their WhatsApp channel. I remember talking about that with someone with, uh, at WhatsApp and they were questioning uh, whether that complied with their terms of service, which is why I'm curious to see where that initiative ultimately went. Um, but also seeing some interventions from, um, like when we think about a coordinated inauthentic behavior approach where you're not looking necessarily at content, but trying to identify behaviors that might be problematic. Um, uh, Driyajit, the Brazil example you might have been referring to is work that the um, electoral tribunal in Brazil had done through an MOU with WhatsApp where um, they were able to report um, accounts that were sort of batch forwarding or batch spamming um, messages. Um, and WhatsApp actually was pretty responsive in taking action on those particular accounts. Um, so an example of a type of intervention that's trying to protect sort of the privacy led need for encryption while also recognizing a need to sort of um, push back against Harm. Well, I want to thank everybody for um, these really spectacular and diverse contributions to this complex topic. Uh, I first of all want to thank Ashani also for uh, for her role in convening this conversation today, um, and thank each of our panelists um, for sharing their perspectives. Um, for uh, everybody else in the audience, um, and for some folks who are here in person too, uh, for updates on future events through Center for Asian Democracy here um, and research, including a couple of products about to, to drop this afternoon and tomorrow on next week's Nepal election, um, check out CAD's website through U of L um, or Twitter and Facebook feeds. Um, and uh, and again, want to thank uh, everyone for being here today and sharing in the conversation. So thank you all very much, and we'll see you next time.